So every morning in newspapers around the world and news organizations, there is a hallowed tradition. The editor gathers senior writers and discusses the leading issues of the day and decides the editorial line for the next day's newspaper or website. Well, today we're going to break with that tradition and for the first time in the FT's over 125-year-old history, the FT editor Lionel Barber here is going to conduct a leader debate live. And the discussions will, or the results of the debate, I should say, will appear in the editorial column next week. So for this debate, we have Martin Wolf, the FT's chief economics commentator, who needs no introduction to any of you, a man who I regard as the roving gray cell of the FT. We have Brooke Masters, uh, the FT's uh, company's editor, who I worked with very closely when I was news editor, uh, and I depended on her hugely as a relentless and ferocious prober of corporate peccadilloes. She's also introduced some fantastic new words into the FT lexicon, my favorite being wackadoodle, uh, which uh, is used of companies that have done something so utterly, utterly outrageous, you might think it's fake news, but it's not, it's true. Rula Khalaf there, the FT's deputy editor, former foreign editor, former Middle East editor, longtime former foreign correspondent who knows more about the Middle East, frankly, than probably anyone in London, and Rob Armstrong there at the end who has the uh, awkward task most days of having to try and steer this discussion. He is a, uh, one of our top business writers. He used to edit the Lex column. A uh, uh, little FT Weekend note here. He's also about to start a fashion column for the FT Weekend. And then, uh, and then Lionel here, who uh, has been introduced to you early, earlier and who you all know, he uh, is responsible pr for presiding over this great debate. Lionel, over to you. Well, thank you, Alec. Um, this does feel rather odd um, because normally nobody is looking at us when we discuss, or at least there are a few press noses against the glass windows. But can we just get a couple of ground rules established here? I mean, first of all, is this a select bunch that decides this editorial uh, line, or, or do we allow um, interlopers to come in, Rob? I mean, you are the chief leader writer. Uh, I had to spend about two weeks to persuade you to do the job. <laughs> I think, I think we'll take a few questions or comments or uh, additions to the editorial line from the audience, which we will take or leave as we please. Yeah. Don't you think? There's nothing new about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's how we all feel. Yeah. Uh, so should we talk, that we're going to do two topics today? Well, you can do three, but we, I, I thought I'd agreed two with you. So we've had a big, we've had a big Brexit summer, yeah. and we've had a big Uber summer. So we need editorials or leaders, as you say in this funny country, uh, leaders on those two topics next week for sure, so we can go through those. Yeah, let, let, let's take Brexit, but we need the angle, Rob. We, we, need, we need to frame the debate. So we're looking for a hook. Yeah. Uh, I know you were in the States last week, uh, but you presumably followed the news enough to third yeah. round of negotiations. I mean, to me, because we're all trying to be, I think the term is positive. Mm. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've got to try and frame this debate about, look, we'll answer the question, how's May doing the government negotiating, tacti negotiating tactics, but it's kind of, isn't it, let's start Martin, isn't it about how do we get to a transition deal? Or is, is that just half the answer? Well, I think it's how we get to a deal, of which the transition is a big part. Um, my own view... I should say in the introduction, I've been attending leader conferences pretty regularly for 30 years, and this is quite a, a, a novel experience. So it, it won't be perhaps quite like the normal leader conference. But anyway, my answer to your question is we need to get to a deal. There is, we've had 15 months in which, in my view, on that, as far as that's concerned, we've made absolutely no progress at all, zero. And the... There's been a lot of, we put together some papers in which they're, which they're not very interested in, uh, but we haven't actually had a serious negotiation. The deal, the shape of this deal, whatever it is, has to be agreed, in my view, in significantly less than 12 months. 
in fact, the, the quicker the better, because business, everybody has to have a basis for planning. The people who live here from the EU, everybody has to know what's going on. So we have very limited time. And at this stage, we're still discussing how to go about the negotiation. And it seems to me the significant moment is the reference by a very senior minister, alas, involved in this, to the EU's negotiating position as quote unquote blackmail. This is not very helpful, it's a negotiating position. So my view is the leader has to say, what do we need to do to get the negotiation to proceed, given the reality that their cards are much stronger than our cards, and we are not going to determine how the negotiation goes. My view is the starting point for that has to be, we're going to have to agree up front to paying a fair amount of money. That's where it starts. We've got to agree on the money. So I the FT is going to say surrender. Is that is that uh, what you're the, the, suggesting? The, 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 on the contrary, in the the uh, we agree on the exit fee, which is actually, if we when we can discuss this later, quite trivial, and the uh, and of course Six, we then sixty billion, <laughs> quite trivial. 60, by the way, sixty billion is about million. three and a half percent of GDP. In the context of the, we're going to borrow it and amortize it over thirty years. That's uh, in the context of our debt, GDP, and that completely Martin, trivial. I want, so, so we have to. We, we all want to interrupt before you get any more momentum, Martin. Okay. <laughs> so we've got to do a deal on the money. Uh, I, I mean, are we even through the transition period yet? I think that's something the leader has to tackle first. So we had some movement in the tectonic plates this summer, which we welcomed in an, editor, uh, an earlier leader that noted the Conservative Party has shown a few glimmerings of something resembling realism on this topic in terms of what they're willing to discuss. And to our surprise, the Labour Party announced a platform for the transition that sounded like something the FT could embrace, which was, we just play by Europe's rules during the transition period, end of story. I, I Can we get that deal? I think you're Have we even gotten it. to discussing the deal yet? I think yet? you're oversimplifying. Uh, where we are right now is that we are stuck on what comes first. The, the main problem with last week's negotiations were over the, divor the divorce bill. Now, it, it seems to me that the government is its own worst enemy here because we make a step forward and then on the most important issue for the EU right now, although I am personally sympathetic with the position of the government, you, c you will not get to the final number unless you agree a transition. But what is really important right now is to send the right message. So what we have is one minister that says, go whistle, and the other, another minister that says, uh, we are ready to meet our obligations. Well, which is it? We need in this leader to make clear that there has to be a position paper on the divorce bill, which does not set out the figures, but does set out the principles that we are willing to agree on. So you have the issue of the obligations for 2020, 21, which if there is a transition, we're gonna have to pay them anyway. Uh, and then you have the issue of pensions, which I think through a third party can be resolved. And then you have the issue of the type of deal that we get and what agencies do we pay into. And that is also related to the final deal. But we need principles. There's one thing that I was reading yesterday that I just I wanted to quote. Because I, I thought that that's exactly where we are, um, where the government is, unfortunately. Um, this is a quote from um, the French ambassador to the EU. He says that the, the UK position is we want to leave, but we're not really ready to fully assume the inevitable consequences. Okay, so we got an item there. We are going to call for a paper on the divorce bill and just give us the math, right? But what's the difference between setting out principles and just saying what your negotiating position is? Well, it is the same thing, but right. what I'm saying is you don't have to say this is what I'm going to pay, but right. you do have to say I am willing to meet my obligations until 2021. They're still now saying until 2019, for instance. Okay, so Lionel, are we assuming for the purpose of this leader, I'm just trying to get something written in my head here. Are we assuming the transition's in the bag, right? No. And we're now moving to the other no, side. No. no. You, 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 we, we need no, the transition. The That's the crucial yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, but, so... This is the point. In, in the negotiations, 
there's a lot of noise, there's sort of blackmail, go whistle. But what is needed from either side to get to a mutual agreement in principle that the transition, a transition, is necessary? Anybody got any ideas on that? I think we're almost there. I think okay. we are almost at the point of everybody understanding that there's going to be a transition. It is the nature of the transition right. that is being debated right now. But don't you have the impression, I mean, we, we've written this, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, contrary to what people may think, we actually do take into account what we wrote last week. Um, sometimes so a mistake. Yeah, sometimes. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but don't you get the impression, I mean, Brooke, you, you're watching this, I know you're looking at it from the company side, that, that the government is negotiating with itself, and we're not really, you know, got any consideration of, we've got to negotiate with 27, and Mr. Barnier. I would absolutely agree with that. I think part of the problem is, now that Labour has set out that they want a clear transition... Um, I oh, a little closer. Hi, sorry. Um, now that Labour set out that they want to stay in for the transition, they want to just go by the rules, deal with it, pay in, et cetera, it is not clear to me, the Conservatives do, therefore don't have a position because they know if they take whatever Mrs. May's natural position, which is probably tougher than that, she'll lose too many votes. So we're basically, the government needs to sort of come up with something that it can hold a majority on. And I, and I think that's, that's what's holding them is up. Is that even so, possible? Well, no. Shouldn't we be giving in this leader... Um, Rob, Martin, Rula, I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't we get a bit of a sense of what we expect in Mrs. May's speech in two weeks' time, which has been called the Lancaster 2 speech, because Lancaster 1 uh, was, Lancaster House 1 was when she said, we're not going to be part of the customs union, so, we're not going to be part of the single market. I, I think the answer is very clear. I mean, for me, the first paragraph of this leader would say, you know, Labour has given an example of clarity on one issue. Agree or disagree with you, their You're position. going to put that in the first paragraph? <laughs> Maybe not the I first don't think sentence, so right? Okay. And now it's mis and, and now May has to come to the table with maybe not necessarily agreement, but equivalent clarity. And the first topic for me has to be transition, and well, then money. We've and then written that leader. We wrote it two weeks ago. Mm. Right. I think that's that never stopped us before. But look, it's I think that's the wrong order. Um, I, I'm, of course, I usually have a different view, which is one of the wonderful advantages of a column, columnist, because I can write the column, which takes a different view from the leader. But my view is we have to take head on the issue of how we make the negotiation work. We know that we are moving towards a position in this country where we'd like the transition, whether we can do the transition deal, a transition which is pretty close to the European economic area situation. That raises huge political problems for the Conservative Party, and because it's almost certainly going to mean that we're not going to be able to control immigration during that period. That's a very big issue we're going to come to. But the point I'm making is we're not going to, as it's simply a matter of fact, we're not going to get to that discussion with the EU. They will not discuss it with us. Whether it's blackmail or unpleasant, it's a reality. Should we criticise them for that, Martin? Get to the divorce deal. And mm. that means that Theresa May's speech has to start for the first time in this appalling shambles we have in this country <laughs> by saying, by saying to her party and the people, you know, to get a good deal, and by the way, we do need a deal, the no deal position I've been putting forward is absolute nonsense, the, to get a deal, we are going to have to pay. We are, she has to say that. She's never said it. As long as that's the case, there is no negotiation. It's a zero, a null set. Brooke? I was wondering whether we should compare this to an actual divorce where there are children involved. Because actually, that's what, what you want and what you're dreaming of and what you think is fair doesn't matter when there are children involved. You have to do something that helps, that, that keeps yeah, their wealth that, That's a column, not a leader. All Otherwise, right. these, st steady on with the metaphors. <laughs> okay, so, so as, Very good as, usual, as usual, Martin gives us the clarity, usually at the beginning of leader conference, but also at the end of leader conference. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right. This, our leader for next week needs to focus 
on that issue of the divorce bill because that is what is holding up these negotiations. We are not going to be taken seriously unless we can break this long jam. Yeah. Should we, should we have a ref to Northern Ireland? Or do we think sufficient progress is well, being made to the, the EU residency issue is part of the divorce bill. The institutions are clearly part of the are engaged in what's going to happen with the institutions is part of the divorce bill and I think it's very appropriate to wrap the Irish issue into it. We're not going to get into this dream, dreamy discussion of the transition until there is clear progress on the divorce areas as the EU has made clear and in any case in my view is logical. You discuss the divorce and then you discuss how you live afterwards with the person you've just divorced. Okay so I'm Rob I'm just conscious of time here yes. and I'm conscious that the, the leader, the editorial, is, what is it, 513 words? Or 512? Shade more. Okay, okay, all right. So, so just help me on the structure here. Right. So I think we're in agreement that, we're gonna t that we start from the money, right? right? And that Theresa May has to look the bill in the face, right? And make that clear to her voters. Uh, it's a matter, you know, so... It's a matter of from there, do we talk about the specifics of the money, how she should negotiate from there? Do we talk about what is possible to discuss once you've uh, met, once you've encountered reality on the money, what comes next? The money unlocks the negotiation. That's yeah. the point, yeah? Yeah. It's the, ascent, it's the precondition for having a serious discussion, A, about transition, but are we going to mention you know, what, what Mrs. May and others are talking about, the future relationship with the EU? Or is that too much to stuff in one leader? I mean, my, my view, I mean, you may disagree, is that when we, you talk about transition, what you're doing is buying yourself time. So right. all the parties involved can take a deep breath and pursue, it reduces the political pressure and the internal pressure for, for the, both sides. And, 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 and introducing an element of certainty, which is the business argument, which is really important, right? Right, because for the businesses, remember, they, they operate fundamentally, the big financial services businesses especially operate on a school year basis. Yeah. So if they need to know where their people need to be in September 2019. Um, and therefore, if we can buy them a few more years, that we know well, my, that it's yeah. clearly... Um, that, that they clearly don't have to move their people instantly because there will be a transition, then they won't have to make uh, decisions that can't be undone. Yeah, I think that, I, by the way, Rob, I think that's a really good practical question. So we've got a lot of philosophy. Yeah. Sorry, Martin. Um, but the, there's, a, if you like, you could say the, the prosaic question of whether people are actually going to move, they got to figure out homes and school, school terms, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Are we uh, almost so we, there? We, we, we're, I think we're almost there. Uh, well, what, come on. What's the conclusion? I mean, I, the, no, the, the question I want to ask you it's is, serious. do we have to deal with the real political difficulties this raises for May and the Tories? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, we can stamp our foot all we want, but maybe May is in a trap she can't get out of. Well, do we need to nod to that in the My leader? view has always been, absolutely consistently, that there will be no deal. Because it, the deal, there is no deal that is acceptable to the EU that she will be able to get through the House. Now, I hope that's wrong. Obviously, I hope that's wrong. But that seems to me plausible. But we can't go on pretending that the, 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 not, the, the thing that she can't get through, that she can get through the House through the Conservative Party is the thing the EU will accept, because it, it won't. Uh, so she has to go for it something she has to go for a strategy that gives her a chance of reaching a deal with the EU. It is perfectly possible that there is no deal with the EU that can also be passed through the House under this Parliament. It is perfectly possible. In my view, it's overwhelmingly likely. But she at least has to... She's the Prime Minister. It's her job to get a deal. She has to start by proceeding with a strategy that gives her some chance of this. How might she be able to sell it? This is... I think that what she sells is, yes, there is some money involved, which you don't like, but at the end of this, we are going to leave, one, we will have a smooth transition, two, and thereafter, after this transition period, we will be able to, to do what you want 
pursue our own trade policy. That's the way she has to sell it to the Conservative Party. Can she do so? Probably uh, not, but it's the only way a Prime I, Minister can proceed. I think that's where we conclude, is a kind of Scylla and Charybdis imagery uh, for the Prime Minister, right? She has yeah. to find her way between these two. Okay, Ruben, I think, and then I have I think one there's thought. just one really Im important point that, that we need to make is that y you have to understand le where your lever le uh, lies in an, any negotiation. And the problem here is that the government thinks it has more leverage than it really has. And it simply doesn't have much leverage. Now, w if you have very weak cards, you have to be really, really, really smart in how you play them. And the problem is so far, what we have seen is there is an exaggeration of the leverage rather than focus on you know, I have very weak cards, and this is what I need to do. Okay, so we need to close this out, but yeah. I, got, I, got, I just got two thoughts in terms of the ending. Um, one, Rula, you're right, but we can't at the FT say that in those, quite those words, because it, it just we're going to get branded as, you know, loser mentality FT, Ramonas, so we can't have that, okay? Um, <laughs> it's not fine by me. Right? Okay. Well, there's this little detail which and, Lionel <laughs> hasn't mentioned, is that in leader conference, we all talk, sometimes we spend an hour talking, but, we, but the last word is yes. his. <laughs> okay. So, so the last word would be, I think we, want, we, we need a bit of a kind of, not a limp-wristed ending. We need, a, we need a, something like Mrs. May, I don't know, something like, Mrs. May, it's time to put the national interest above the party interest. How's that? Yeah. You know something? What makes this such a great occasion is when I come out with a line like that, nobody claps inside the FTM. Um, we have time for maybe uh, two, two questions for the audience before we move on to Uber. The gentleman in the, in the red shirt in the front row was the first one I saw. We'll take suggestions again, under advisement. Does the panel feel that the EU is respecting the democratic value of the referendum? Or is the EU just focused on not encouraging other members from leaving? Well, I don't think that... It's not a question in the... In the uh, look, we decided to leave. We're in a negotiation. And that is what's taking place. So... So I don't think they're trying to undo anything. They, you know, we didn't make that decision and that's what Ruler was alluding to earlier, right? I think that's right. I would say there's nothing to be gained in bashing the EU and saying they're not respecting our democracy. It is what it is, just deal. Yeah. Uh, there's a gentleman in the front or the back. Yeah. One more down here. Uh, thank you. Um, I work in construction and I work up and down the country and the question I think that we have to answer is what's going to be the deal for those who voted for Brexit? What sort of future is, are we suggesting? Even if they're going to have to be massive compromises, what are those compromises going to be? And you know, Because those are the people who are going to be really pissed if as it seems to them, we don't effectively leave the EU. Most, most people in the so-called rank and file don't really understand the difference between uh, transition periods and so on and so forth. And they just think we should, they think we've already left. Uh, they'd be mistaken about that. <laughs> Martin. Um, what are we going to offer the people who voted for Brexit? Uh, well, I have, I have two parts to that answer to that question. <laughs> the first is they're going to be poorer than they hope. Um, that's just a fact. Uh, the second one, which is directed at your, uh, because money doesn't sort of come out of trees. So, and the second one is uh, they can be, I think, pretty confident unless something very, very extraordinary happens. Uh, and difficult to imagine, not in, nothing is inconceivable. But we will leave, but we are not going to leave uh, all association with the EU, because that wasn't actually what was voted on. 
uh, uh, in uh, 2019, because the shock of that will be so bad, in my view, and many others, that they would be much worse affected than if we have a smoother transition. That seems to me a pretty straightforward answer. I think uh, we should... Um, rule no, I, I just wanted to say, I find your, your question really interesting because what people didn't realize in, vote, uh, in voting for Brexit is that uh, this is a process and it's a process that plays out over a very long period of time. And at the same time, uh, I think there is a real attempt to sort of leave without leaving, uh, at least to maintain all the benefits of, of the EU. And so I, I understand that it can be quite confusing for people. We had a, we had a brief debate uh, outside the tent before we started uh, between the group of us, and the topic was how to pronounce the last name of the new Uber CEO. <laughs> and uh, the group reached... a moderate consensus, uh, an unstable consensus over Kasra Shahi. Uh, is that okay? How did I do? Kasra Shahi. Okay, good. Kasra Shahi. Uh, Uber has a new CEO. This is a business that's become uh, very important to the way a lot of us in London live and in the world live, but they've had a terrible problem with uh, how to manage the amount of growth they've had and the character of Travis Kalanick, the Last CEO has been an issue. So the FT needs a line on what Mr. Kasrashahi should do now. Brooke. Well, I think we should think about first what he was hired to do. Um, Travis was unceremoniously booted from running the place, but of course still controls a big block of shares. Um, it's private, but it, there are untraded shares. Um, on the grounds that, for a couple of reasons. One is that the place has a toxic culture that's sexist and alienating people, that it's fighting with all of it, with regulators around the world, and of course it has no path to profitability. This is the biggest and most valuable private company in the world. However, it is also the biggest money loser of private companies in the world. I mean, it's losing billions every year. And, and, and Dara, because that's all I can manage to say, has promised in his first um, speech to to the employees that he is going to try and seek an initial public offering in 18 to 36 months. Um, in general, it, people are not very excited to buy shares, and I think you shouldn't be either, in companies that have no path to profitability. <laughs> I, I, let me just say that that, I mean, this is, we haven't seen the books, right? We don't know. A lot of no path to profitability points were made about Amazon, and Amazon is still not a very profitable company, but it makes a profit, and it has profit potential and its shareholders have put up with it for decades without making very much money. Surely uh, the new CEO wants to repeat the same trick. Uh, I, I, would, I would just leave it there. I'm not going to leave the no path okay. comment totally uncontested. I mean, I, I think it's important to look at the model and I think the model is uh, slightly different from, from Amazon, not least because Amazon has been able to add on new, uh, new services. Uh, but the question of whether Uber is going to be able to make money, to me, and I'm, I'm, as you know, not a fan of Uber at all, not as a customer and not as an uh, analyst. I've, uh, I've actually deleted uh, the app, uh, and I think there's a real ethical issue with this company. Uh, anyway, do you, do you want to not... spell that out a bit? Yeah, yeah, please. please. I mean, that's a pretty actually, serious charge. Actually, actually, let's that. just ask how many people, people here. Uh, think that Uber is a wonderful service. Wow. Okay. Uh, so how many people here think that it's a terrible service? Okay. Well, that's, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 Unethical? Wonderful yet unethical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but the point... I, I think that this is a company that we have benefited in because benefited from. Uh, Martin and I use Adly, for instance, and Adly prices have come down, so we appreciate that. But as soon as Uber raises its prices, I think people will flee and drivers will also flee, and they already are. So I don't see a path for profitability. Can we just remind everybody, do, do we actually call on Travis... Kalanick to step down. Did we do that? Because that's, that's yes. pretty... We did. We did. Alphaville. I know Alphaville did. Alphaville was first. I saw the post. A little <laughs> earlier than we did. I, I'm well aware of that, Izzy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
get in their mind. I, I, I was not discussing these business subjects because I don't really have any strong views on them. But I have a question about what the leader is going to, to say. So I think that as an outside reader on a leader on Uber, there are two sort of different questions, and I'd like to know what the link is, perhaps for Brooke. So one set of questions is the values on which the company itself operates internally. This is obviously a pretty stinking mess, and presumably the first thing you would say, it's sort of a paragraph, I suppose, maybe two, is he's got to clean that up. That's sort of straightforward. Um, uh, and I presume that is doable. I imagine it's doable even in Silicon Valley. Uh, but you can discuss that. Now, the second question is, uh, is this a profitable business? And if so, how should he proceed to make it a profitable business? Um, now, one question there is, how far is that related to this culture thing that we've just been talking about? Or is it actually independent? And to the extent that it is independent, what actually is a sensible strategy in this case? You proceed down the line. If the shareholders are prepared to give you free money for a very long time, is Take the rational it. strategy to go on burning free money until you finally burn everybody out of the business? Or do you say to the shareholders, well, you're very generous in giving us this free money in the hope that we'll end up with the monopoly of the world's transportation system. We probably won't, but keep going. It's worth trying because there's no other business strategy for us. I think there is an internal... I, I think we should argue, and uh, we have argued in the past, that there is an internal connection between the business model and the ethical culture. It's not 100% overlap, but the point is simply this. It took tremendous aggressiveness and disregard for rules and standard ways of business to get this business to where it was. It just wouldn't have happened if they were nice guys who played by the rules. And I use the word guys advisedly in this case, of course. So the question is, maybe they're big enough now that late in the day they can become nice. Maybe we should say it's time for them to do that. But to, ar but to argue that you can make an Uber without trampling people and things and cultures and regulators, I think it's just mad. But there's a point of to what extent was this culture due to the genius CEO that they had and what kind of difference does a CEO with a completely different background, completely different personality as the person in the news that we wrote uh, today shows, to what extent will that make a difference? Yeah, because I'm, I'm conscious of one of our columnists just the other week wrote a column saying CEOs don't really matter. Which, which I, I had a bit of a problem with. I can see why. John Reading must you, as well. Yeah, you, you edited that column, didn't you? Yeah. I did indeed. Yeah. Um, or you I, didn't. I, <laughs> no, I, actually, I did. Um, uh, but I didn't write it. No, you didn't. <laughs> but I, th I think... You know, I don't think we want to get in necessarily get into... That was unfair, by the way, because yeah, yeah. you would disagree with it as well. <laughs> I know. But there's a, there, there is a point. I mean, you again, I, I'm just going back here, but you, Rob, I mean, I remember when we talked about Uber earlier, about 18 months ago, we, we wrote about the, the risks in the cult of the CEO, but recognising that Travis Kalanick was an extraordinary kind of dynamic... Can I change the order of business? Yeah, go on. Can I point out that one of the other Silicon Valley uh, innovators, Airbnb, which in many ways is a similar kind of business that similarly has upended things, is famous for being cooperative. It has more women. It has it is considered open and inclusive. It it spends a lot of time trying to stimulate uh, contributions from its employees, and it it is absolutely completely culturally different. And yet it too is completely upending a business model. But it I mean, also, it's reference. also in an easier business, right? Apartments and houses don't drive around in streets. Apartments and houses are regulated in very different ways than cars are. Airbnb has had an easier run, I would argue. The hotel industry would say that, in fact, they've done the same thing, which is they've avoided the regulations that make the hotel industry expensive. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. There are clearly somewhat different things going on, but I don't think you have to be a complete jerk or a, All right, so to make money I or change agree. I, I Yeah, I, and I think, I, you know, just to just some light hand here, Rob, because you're in charge, really. Uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> um, just, I think we should have a reference to Airbnb. I like that. I don't think it should be just about Uber. We did a Lex note on Uber just a few days ago saying 
they should go public earlier. Should, do we should do we take a view on that? By the I way, I mean, th- this is one. This is a, ta- a question that we tackle again and again. Is public o- does a public ownership have a tonic effect on businesses in terms of their? Are they more responsible? Are they more transparent? Are they do they adopt more sustainable strategies or indeed the uh, the opposite? I know what Martin is thinking right now. Maybe I'll let him ar- articulate the this point. I think the evidence on that is, uh, as I read it, is highly debatable. There are pros and cons of public ownership and private ownership. They're, di- they're somewhat different. They overlap in some ways. And I don't think there's any clear and unambiguous answer to the question of whether public ownership is superior to private ownership. It depends a lot at the stage of the company, uh, um, um, the nature of the private owners, uh, what they can contribute uh, to this. In this particular case, the venture capitalists seem to have got themselves into a hell of a mess. So it might well be, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a war in there, isn't it, in the, among these? So if, in that case, probably many of the benefits of the private ownership uh, are gone. But I don't think we need to get into this. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to me that whether they go public or private is not to me exciting. What is exciting is whether we can offer anything at the end of, of actually how you make this what is a sensible strategy, assuming he handles all the ethical stuff, he's, he runs a decent company, what actually, given that, is a sensible strategy for this business? Yeah, but we, we just need, in terms of the structure of this leader, um, I'll come to the outro in a minute, the, the conclusion, but we kind of, the, the, the body of the leader is going to be, this is, this is what we think his agenda should be, right? And that will include kind of cleaning up I mean, they've started on the ethical mess, yeah. the culture. I mean, this is, this is crucial. What, what's, what's the conclusion? I mean, we wish you well, or...? Uh, what, one conclusion we could write, I'm just putting it out there, is this is a company that affects all of our... Everyone who lives in a city, this company affects their lives dramatically. And at least if the company was public, the general public, who all have a stake in the company's future, would have more visibility into it. I don't know if I buy that, but I would know how to write it. <laughs> uh, well, well, that settles it, I guess. <laughs> uh, another, Look, another, another... What about regulation? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 let, let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. The point, point number two that you could make is... Whether you think you need to be a jerk to grow a company like this or not, the growth phase is effectively over, and it's time for grown-ups now. Right? Whether, whether we got here one way or the other, the company is now at a scale. It has a responsibility that it didn't have before. It has to meet that responsibility. The, the, and the final question is, is how do regulators handle this company on and, going out. And I think you can say that this is the real test of Uber right now. Until now, it's been sort of, everything has been a test of Travis. Now is the real test of whether this business model can actually um, work. Okay, so I think I've got the, the, the last sentence. Uh, Rob, what do you think? Are you writing it down? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Good. Pen ready. <laughs> okay, so, so it's, it's just two words. <laughs> Grow up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I that think, didn't work. Yeah, no, no, I think... I, <laughs> I, yeah. It's time to time show to whether it can really grow up. Yeah, something like... Right, and, you and I think the way, one way you could weave the regulator point, regulation point is, is either you grow up or society is going to grow you up. Or make you grow up. Make you grow, make up. You grow up. And which one would you prefer? So what's, what's the headline? Something about teenager? Uh, <laughs> mm. It's not... Oop. Yeah, headlines. Uh, I always test them on a headline. Should we... Uh, maybe the crowd has better ideas. Does anybody have a comment that they would like to yeah. uh, uh, offer? <laughs> in, the, in the front row here. So it's not really a suggestion for the title, but my question actually was... Um, why focus so much on doing the thinking for the new CEO of Uber? Why not think about other competitors that have got the right culture, um, that are doing really well, and talk about this technological innovation as a sector in an industry? Um, because I'd be more interested in reading that. Um, uh, was that a suggestion or a job we, application? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Because <laughs> you've got it. Uh, yeah, Rob? It sounds like a very sensible suggestion. Uh, maybe we should have started from there. Am I hearing a, a call for a, a company's read on alternatives to 
Uber. I think perhaps we're going to, we'll try and organize a, a nice big analytical piece looking at what are the alternatives, who's yeah. succeeding, what are their challenges. Thank we you. Had a, we had a very, sti- I should mention, if, if anybody's interested in this topic and haven't read it, our, uh, our man in Tokyo, uh, it was, I think it was uh, Robin Harling wrote a piece saying that Uber is effectively a stock exchange. And in stock exchanges, anybody who wants to put in a bid or an ask is allowed to put in a bid or an ask. It doesn't. If a Lyft car wants to go on the exchange, they can go on the exchange. Anybody wants to go on the exchange, and that is how. Instead of having, you wouldn't want to have a private stock exchange where only the club were included. You want all the bids and acts to be public, and that that's an option for how to regulate a business like this, which would of course uh, make it very different from a profit point of view. Yeah, Rob, I think we're out of time. Oh, we've got five minutes? Five minutes. Oh, another right. another. Any comment? other suggestions for headlines or rewriting the completely the editorial? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, take, take, please take the microphone. Have you used before that it's a driverless company rather than driverless cars? Oh. Yeah, we, we, we have used that gag to death. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> Can I ask, um, didn't the FT give Travis a boldness in business award not very long ago? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm gonna. <laughs> there's two judges. There's two judges in this panel on the judge uh, on the boldness in business award. Yeah, and I blame you. It's Brooke and <laughs> no, it's Brooke I, and Rule. I wasn't on that one. Okay, uh, I, I know. Was. I, no, I, I don't I, even know I'll what take, the boldness in business awards is. Uh, did, he was bold. Yeah, yeah. It's not a niceness in business award. Was it's honestly not. If you read what we give those awards for, it's for it's for changing things, and you can't argue with this boldness. It's not. Yeah. It's just not the yeah. sweethearts in business award. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we but, but the lady is absolutely Genghis right. Genghis Khan gets the boldness in politics award. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just a suggestion for your headline: Time for tantrums is over. I'm liking okay. that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Got it. Uh, All right. This one in the middle. The what? <laughs> puberty is over. Yeah, I d- that sells. Are, do we use the word puberty in the FT? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> We're all grown up. Uh, in the middle. He's, a, he's a had a gentleman question. in the middle. A gentleman, oh. uh, he's got a Travis Kalanick hat on. I don't know why you're surprised. I mean, the whole industry, I mean, Snap, Spotify, no path to profitability. The whole industry bends, breaks the rules. They're no different. There is a separate leader to be written about whether we're in a second, third, third? Tech bubble. Second, really. Second, I think. And, yeah, and there's a lively debate within the FT on that question, whether the businesses are different now. And, of course, we, you make distinctions between some of these guys, but certainly... To anyone trained as a financial analyst, reading the Snap prospectus was a bone-chilling experience. Uh, I think we got we got it's one. It's a gold you, rush. You, gold you, rush is there's a gentleman in the middle money. who hasn't asked a question before, so. Thank you. It's Uber time to change. <laughs> But uh, otherwise, there, don't there you realize that puns are banned at the FT? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Just, just, just to add one one thing, there's there's a very large set of evidence that uh, uh, the fight at Uber behaved like a, a very bad company didn't help them to expand. What helped them was their boldness. But actually, if you look concretely on many markets, the fight that they behave in such a bad way, it was a huge obstacle for the development. It didn't help them at all. Right. Uber is not over. Right. There's a question in the corner. Thank you. Suggestion for a headline. If you're prescribing or criticizing them, how about a crash course in driving? All right. I think puberty is over wins. If we can, <laughs> okay. if we can get it past Lionel, we'll take it. Sh- should we call it there, Alec? Lionel, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've actually seen Lionel over the years from time to time stamp his foot and say, we need more people to come to leader conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you've answered. <laughs> but that said, uh, democratization and leader conferences, this is uh, an interesting question. So 
I'd really like to thank all my colleagues uh, for taking part. Uh, the most preposterous line, I think, that was, was, was uttered uh, was actually improbably from Martin when he said, uh, in reference to business stories, uh, I don't have strong opinions on them. Martin has strong <laughs> opinions on absolutely everything. Uh, one last thing, I'd like, to just, I'd like you all just to just think about Rob Armstrong in the next 24 hours. He now has to make sense of this, bring it, bring it together, and write it. Anyway, I think I, we should just all thank the panelists. And okay, brief break, and then we're and then we're back.